What is going on? It is Food for Thought Podcast by Roto Grinders. It's week two. It's already week two. We had so much anticipation for week one, and now it's here. We've got a week in the books. We've got some information in the books. But most importantly, friend of the show, not only friend of the show, friend in real life, too. We've got Nick the Commish. He's coming on this week. Luch is out in the Cayman Islands somewhere having a good time. Uh, I'm just kidding. He is on vacation, though. Kamish, what's going on, my brother? How's everything? What's going on, Chief? Week week was good. Uh, weekend was good. And now we get to do it all over again, man. Good to see you. Yeah, for sure. And I, the one thing I do love about this podcast is um, despite us nerding out at the end of the week, we just get to let our hair down and be sports fans on this podcast and just talk about a few things. Uh, you know, the lines are out or, at least, you know, some of the totals are out already. I'm sure some of those will adjust as we get a little closer to the end of the week. But, uh, you know, we're going to try to keep this podcast on the rails this week. Last week we were off the rails. I think we went about an hour and a half or a little more than an hour and a half. We're not going an hour and a half this week, folks. Uh, I'm going to try to get us out of here in 45 minutes to make up for our overage last week and we'll balance this whole thing out so here we go week one biggest takeaway from last week i think there are a few takeaways what was yours my biggest takeaway is the cleveland browns are legitimate super bowl contenders if they can figure out right tackle jack conklin uh, right tackle out for the season 20 cl mcl that's going to be a potential issue, especially against teams that are adept at getting pressure. You think about the Pittsburgh Steelers in week two. TJ Watt against a rookie right tackle could could Problems. could be interesting. But I was very, very, very encouraged by what the defense brought. I know the weather was bad. It, you know, it rained the whole game. But the defense got after it. They got after the Cincinnati Bengals, and that was without Juan Thornhill, big safety acquisition from the offseason. The defense looks a lot better with uh, new defensive coordinator Jim Schwartz. Most important, I think they have a lot more talent there. Last year, the interior of the defensive line was only there in spirit. You know, they didn't really have a whole lot of talent there. The teams could run all over them, especially in third and short. So add in Zadarius Smith, Dalvin Tomlinson, add in Rodney McLeod at safety. Thornhill will be back. I think the defense is really deep, which is important. And the offensive play calling, I thought, was tremendous. You know, Deshaun Watson missed a bunch of throws, and I'm willing to throw that – out to the weather for week one we heard about the ball was heavy it was wet those adverse conditions were a huge impact but man if Deshaun Watson can make a few throws the Cleveland Browns are a lot lot better than even I thought going into the season well listen I'm going to piggyback that as you know I am not a Browns fan I am a Carolina Panthers fan I I don't have this you know I'm not in love with the Browns but I think if, if anybody's been listening to me bang this drum in the offseason, the Browns have been my sneaky team all offseason. And a lot of it had to do with Deshaun Watson because I felt like he's going to play better. Let me tell you something. Look at what Joe Burrow did in this game. Like, like that's, the, that's the other half of this takeaway. Do, do, do people realize Joe Burrow did virtually nothing in, in an American football game? Virtually nothing. Now, yes, I know he, he was coming off of an injury, but this Bengals team did not look good. And while Deshaun Watson probably didn't look great right out of the gate as I anticipated, I'm going to give him a pass with the weather. What he did do was make plays. Like, I think he had 30-something yards rushing on the ground, 30, 30 between 30 45. and 40, 45 yards, rushed in a touchdown. Yeah. Like, that's – that's going to – first of all, that's going to help just keep the defense honest anyway when they know, okay, okay, Deshaun can still take off on us. But being able to score points, like when I look at what Cleveland did, not only did they score touchdowns, they were they were involved in the field goal game. Nick Chubb being able to rattle off over 100 yards in a game they needed him because the weather was so terrible. Like think about what the – think about the offensive line imposing their will on, on the – like, and look. I know one of the offensive linemen is out, and that's – my God, Conklin being out just totally just, – just awful. I mean, just awful. But they were still able to pull out the win. I, I'm with you. I like this one. 
here's my bigger, here's my biggest takeaway. I'm glad you brought up the Browns though, because that, that is my sneaky team this year. Uh my biggest takeaway from week one, this one may be sneaky, um, but I'm 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 gonna roll with it anyway. What if the Jets are better without Aaron Rodgers? <laughs> Don't, this is our rabbit hole, Chief. I knew it. I knew. <laughs> You're not getting on this podcast without hearing about Aaron Rodgers. Listen to me, please, folks. I watched that game because I wanted to see how Aaron Rodgers would perform. Did you watch any of that game, Nick, by chance? Any of the game? Yep. I, I, I missed the first series. I was coming back from practice. And okay, so, I, I saw so the whole you, rest of the game. Okay, so when you when you started watching the game, you were able to see um, Zach Wilson at quarterback. Yep. Okay. All right. So here's my question: Did the Jets win the football game? They did. Okay. Here's my biggest takeaway from Week One. The Jets never needed Aaron Rodgers to win. They need their defense to continue to be outstanding, and they need a quarterback that's not going to turn the ball over. That's all they need. They don't need some superstar to come in there and drag them to the finish line. Like, yes, I know that Aaron Rodgers is better than Zach Wilson conceptually. Don't get me wrong. I'm not an idiot, okay? Conceptually, Zach Wilson is is nowhere near the quarterback of Aaron Rodgers. Part of that is because of Aaron Rodgers' tenure in the NFL. I'll never question Aaron Rodgers' mind in terms of football, right? Like that that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is how much does Aaron Rodgers move the needle actually? See, we get caught up in Aaron Rodgers because he's the successor of Brett Favre's successor of Brett Favre, and he's won a Super Bowl. He's won a Super Bowl, and that was over a decade ago. So I don't want to hear this stupid stuff about Aaron Rodgers is so great. He's not. He's not. And and guess what we saw last night? What I want you to do, Nick, is go back and watch that first series. Aaron Rodgers looks like he was about to get run over by a train. Now, that might not be his fault. That may be the offensive line's fault. But the point is, when you go out and you're a superstar quarterback, You're supposed to be a team elevator. All he did was elevate this team's cachet in the media. They weren't going to win that game last night with Aaron Rodgers. I can tell you right now. I watched the the first series of the game. Yes, I know he got hurt. I'm not wishing anyone gets hurt. But this may have been the best thing ever for the New York Jets, and they don't even know it yet. Because now there's no excuses. You you don't have to even depend on Aaron Rodgers to get you there. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to go out and play football. Aaron Rodgers is going to be a headline, but he's going to sit on the shelf if he's hurt, and they're going to say this team is one of the best teams we've seen. Not Aaron Rodgers saved the Jets because he wasn't about to save them. That series was going horribly, terribly, and the Jets still found a way to win this game at home on Monday night my biggest takeaway is the Jets never needed Aaron Rodgers to begin with. I would agree with you if it was anyone in the league other than Zach Wilson taking over for Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> because you know you know how I feel about Aaron Rodgers, and we talked about the Packers a lot earlier in the week, and I, I, I was pretty adamant, right? Like the, the Packers are better this year with Jordan Love than they were with Aaron Rodgers last say, season. So Say that again? One more time. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you just say the Packers, the Packers are better, are with better Jordan this Love? year? Okay. Yes. And, and honestly, I don't think it's particularly close. And that's no dis- – I mean, it is disrespect to Aaron Rodgers. And I wish him all the best getting it's healthy and all cold. that. But it's, Listen. it's just reality. It's just reality in my mind. Yeah. My last thing here about Aaron Rodgers, Luke. The national media has made Aaron Rodgers out to be Tom Brady, and he's not, right? So I I don't have anything against Aaron Rodgers, actually. What I hate is the media has turned him into some of the all-time greats, and he's not one of those guys. He he doesn't – look, say what you want. Eli Manning was able to close the deal twice. (laughs) <laughs> right say what you want Dan Marino is regarded as one of the greatest of all time he doesn't even have a Super Bowl 
So I'm going to, you know, I'll give him that. But there are plenty of quarterbacks that are that have been comparable to Aaron Rodgers that don't get the same level of respect, like Phillip Rivers. B- because Phillip Rivers doesn't have a, a championship, he doesn't get the same level of respect. He's he, He's been equally as good throughout his career. Yeah, I think my thoughts on Aaron Rodgers, I think he gets a lot of hype because he's obviously got a big arm. So he, he's he's going to make a number of flashy throws. And he throws the ball away a lot where other quarterbacks take shots down yeah. the field. They force they balls into the coverage. So his stats always look very good at the end of the season. He's going to have 35 touchdowns, only five picks, stuff like that. But the reality is there's been quarterbacks that have been significantly more productive and have impacted winning a lot more than Aaron Rodgers over the course of the last 10 or 15 years. And you mentioned guys like Phillip Rivers or like Matt Ryan comes to mind, Matthew Stafford, three yes. Rams. Yes. And, and I think about those guys, and I, I think if you put them in Green Bay and you give them the resources that Aaron Rodgers had for the better part of two decades, how many Super Bowls would those guys have had? And I think it's at least one. You give Tom – Tom Brady was in the NFC for three years, and he's got as many career NFC championships as Aaron Rodgers has. It's, it's just three crazy years. to me. And that's where I think – your point isn't totally off base about the Jets will be fine. Last year, the Jets had one of the best defenses in the NFL, despite the fact that they really, really struggled to generate turnovers. We saw Jordan Whitehead had three interceptions on Monday Night Football. They forced a, a key fumble late in that game. Zach Wilson is atrocious. I mean, Zach Wilson, in my mind, is it's it's hard to believe that he's in his third year and he still looks as bad as he looked last night. But I will say... He's mobile enough that if you can just convince him, hey, throw the football away instead of, you know, getting killed, holding on to it. I've never seen a guy run 35 yards behind the line of scrimmage just to complete a five-yard dump off as much as Zach Wilson does. But if they can simplify the play calling a little bit, my God, Brees Hall looks so good last night. Get the screen game involved. Run the football with him and Dalvin Cook. You still got Garrett Wilson. Like, this is still a deep team. They don't have a lot of depth, so, like, injuries – to other positions, especially on the defensive side of the ball, would, would concern me. But right now, like I think they could go compete with twenty-five other teams in the league, even with Zach Wilson at quarterback. Right, and, and and that's that's really the point I'm trying to make. Like, I don't think Aaron Rodgers is moving the needle as much as we think. Especially, and I know it was just one series, but what I'm going back to is this is how Aaron Rodgers has looked the past two years. Like, dazzled, confused, blaming everybody else when he's on the ground. Like, hey, buddy, you, you get paid big dollars. Let's let's make it happen. All right, that's our, that's our biggest takeaway from week one because I don't want to stay stay in that and down that <laughs> rabbit hole. Nick, what are you? And I do have some other ones, but I'm, I'm going to cut it off there. What are you looking forward to the most in week two? Um, I, I think there's some some interesting dynamics there, especially with some of the performances we saw this week. Um, what, what are you looking forward to the most or seeing the most week two? I'm really looking forward to seeing Miami and New England on Sunday Night Football. Yeah. Miami, I, I'm a huge, huge Mike McDaniel fan. I did not think they were going to go in to L.A. and come out with a win in week one, but I thought – because last year the Chargers were really the first team that was able to slow down that elite Dolphins offense. They did, they, they did a lot of press coverage at the line of scrimmage. They were yeah. able to disrupt that rhythm and timing. But then Tua got hurt, and Mike McDaniel really never had a chance to, to counter the adjustments that started to happen around the league against that offense. But then, of course, you have that full offseason. And then you come back, and Tua throws for almost 500 yards, throws a, a couple of really, really nice balls in important parts of the game. Uh, Tyree Kill looks as good as ever. Jalen Waddle, Bra- Braxton Berrios, like this, the Dolphins lost. Uh, they're, they're they're number three and their number four receiver from last year with Gasecki and with Sherfield leaving, but bringing in Braxton Berrios and they got a couple other guys who made some nice plays against the Chargers. They got a lot of playmakers on that team, and uh, Raheem Mostert looked pretty good. They're really well coached, and I think that defense is only going to get better and better as the year goes along. They don't have Jalen Ramsey right now. Uh, they're still they're they're inputting a new defensive scheme with Vic with Vic, Vic Fangio there, and they still went into LA and beat a team that's supposed to be a Super Bowl contender, and they didn't have their left tackle Teron Armstead. So I'm excited to see what Miami looks like in Week Two. I also thought New England played really really well. Bill O'Brien coming in taking over for Matt Patricia as offensive play caller. 
Who would have thought that the offense actually looked like an offense instead of a defense in week one against the Eagles? If New England didn't turn the ball over a couple of times early in that game and dig themselves a huge hole, New England probably comes out of there with a week one victory. And everyone's talking about how Mac Jones is back and that Belichick's going to have the Patriots in the playoffs. I know a lot of people were surprised that that line was a, a, basically a field goal line coming out of week one. But I think that's going to be a really, really competitive game. And I think New England has the pieces defensively to match up with, with Miami's speed really well. So I think that's going to be a really fun game to watch. Yeah, I like that call. And let me just say news just literally came while we're on this show. Nikki, you may have seen it already. Aaron Rodgers is done. Torn Achilles. Uh, really? that, and, and everybody f- kind of feared that anyway, but, like, we've got real confirmation now. That's it. Um, he is done for the season. Uh, man, I, I hate that for him, even though I, I don't think he has any real impact on them winning or not winning. But um, I'm yeah, wish you all the best with his recovery. Yeah, for sure. I don't uh, – I don't. I don't want anybody to be out because of a season in the injury. I'd rather you play and be judge you accordingly, not be out, you know, because of that. So, uh, prayers for Aaron Rodgers. Sorry about that, man. And um, wow, wow, just whoo, that, that's a big one. Uh, so, what I'm looking forward to the most in Week Two uh, for me, and I, I do like that call with with New England. Um, I, th- I think it's going to get very interesting for for that team if they if they continue to win in that division um, because Buffalo just lost and obviously the Jets are one and zero and so w- what if New England is now the new new splash team in that division and nobody saw it coming that that's very possible considering the circumstances um, and I, I think uh, you know something else on the other side of that Jets games last night. Uh, I know the Jets defense is, you know, really good. Can can we not, can we still trust Josh Allen? Story for another day. But I'm gonna put a pin in that. Hopefully we can get you to come back and let's talk about that. Josh Allen is starting to scare me a little bit. If you just watch it, he's really starting to scare me in terms of he's talented, but the decisions, the deci- it, it's really 37 turnovers to scare me. in his last 19 games, Chief. I'll come back and talk about that anytime you want. Yeah, that that's that's starting to scare me. So, what I'm most looking forward to, uh, personally in week two, is this. So we got news that Chris Jones has now signed a one year deal, and I, I I can't overlook how important that may or may not be right now for the Kansas City Chiefs. Obviously, he's got to come back probably get in some type of game shape. I'm sure he's been working out, but, like, you know, football is a different – like, you still need to be in game form. I don't think he's quite in game form, but I do think he'll probably play this week. Um, Does Travis Kelsey take the field this week? We shall see. What What I think is interesting for me in this particular game is you got Trevor Lawrence and the shiny new toy in Calvin Ridley. But he's also still paired with Christian Kirk. He's still paired with uh, uh, Zay Jones. He's still paired with Evan Ingram. We, we've still got Travis Etienne there. And while I I didn't pick this team to win the division, this team could possibly be 2-0 and just because they have the talent to keep up with Kansas City this week, especially if Mahomes doesn't – especially if Kelsey doesn't play. And if Kelsey doesn't play, the Chiefs may not have enough. With Chris Jones there, this is this is a very interesting dynamic for me because and this is something I talked about in week one. Um, injuries can derail anybody's season, doesn't matter what team it is. It can just blow it all up. And so this Kelsey injury right before week one blew it all up for them in week one. That's, you know, I, I was picking Detroit anyway, but after the Kelsey injury, I just, I, I figured Detroit's going to win that game. So they're 0-1. And right now, I feel like they're already 0-2. Now, everybody's got to strap up. Everybody's got to play the game. But in terms of pure talent, a, a, a 70% Kelsey isn't going to help Patrick Mahomes beat this Jaguars team, I don't think. I think Chelsea's got to be 100%. Uh, 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 Chris Jones just coming back, probably not going to play 100% of the snaps. I don't think that's going to slow down this Jaguars offense enough for them to win. So what I'm looking forward to most in week two do we see improvement from Kansas City? 
right, to give us an inkling that there's still going to be a playoff contending team? Or do they come out and lose this game, right? And then you start looking ahead and you're saying, well, they didn't win that game. You know, week three, I, week three they play the Bears, they'll win that game, right? They should win that game. They'll, they'll be one and two. But then they have to go play the Jets. My, my point to this whole scenario is if they lose this week, by week five, they're less than 500. That's guaranteed. There's, there's no way – like Patrick Mahomes isn't going to just be able to skate by the Jets this year. They're going to be a problem. Um, maybe maybe the Jets go and try to get Mike White, pry him away from uh, from Miami, and say, hey, man, come on back. We need you. Uh, the Jets may make another slight move. At this point, I, I'd be comfortable with Jacoby Brissett in a Jets uniform. Oh, seriously, he'd probably have this team in the playoffs. I'm not exaggerating. Th- these are facts. Um, my point is, the Chiefs could very well be under 500. And so what I'm looking forward to most week two is, do we see any ounce of hope out of this team that's pretty much been the top team in the league for the past four or five seasons? Or is this the beginning of the end for the Kansas City Chiefs? It's going to be interesting to watch. I So one note that I had in my Rotor Grinders article ahead of that Lions matchup in week one, across the last five seasons, the Chiefs have – led the NFL in pressure rate with Chris Jones on the field. When Chris Jones is not on the field, 28th out of 32 teams in the NFL. So Chris Jones is obviously a huge presence, but like you said, the last five years, he's been in game shape every time he's been on the football field. Yeah. And when you're negotiating a contract, like the motivation is just not there, right? In Chris Jones' mind, like you're not in, you're not with the team. You're not using the facilities. There's a lot of stuff going on off the football field. So who knows if he's been working out as much as he's been working out. He definitely hasn't been on the football field doing those types of workouts. And people don't realize as well, they lost Frank Clark this offseason. Yeah. We mentioned Juan Thornhill going over to the Browns. It's not the same Kansas City Chiefs team that went to the Super Bowl and beat the Eagles this past February. It's just not. And at receiver, I'm always a proponent of like, you don't, you don't need elite no, number one receivers to win football games. But you need guys who are going to catch the football when it hits them in the hands. Sky Moore's not that guy. Kadarius Toney wasn't that guy, at least on Thursday night football. If Travis Kelsey isn't there, I mean, Mahomes Mahomes couldn't have played a better football game on Thursday night. Even that fourth and 25 where everybody's like, why are the Chiefs going for it? That ball hit Sky Moore in the hands and he dropped it. That would have been a first down. And maybe they are 1-0. If if, if he can make one play in the course of a football game, maybe they're 1-0. So, I, I'm with you, man. I, I, the, the Jaguars' worst team in the NFL last year defending the tight end position, so I think it is a huge deal whether or not Kelsey plays. If he plays, maybe I believe in the Chiefs a little bit more. But I'm with you. I think that they could really be struggling to get to 10 wins if they if they can't find a way to win this week and and be at 3-2 and two after five weeks, like you said. Right. And and that that's really my concern. Like, it's kind of the look ahead with them. Like, here's my thing, uh, what I will say. When they, by the time they get to the Jets in week four, Zach Wilson may or may not be the quarterback. Like, we saw this last year. Like, th- look, this team needs to win. The defense is built to win. And all they need is a quarterback that's not going to turn the ball over. Like, that's all they need. That's it. And and, and, geez, and they're going to get that first-round pick back to, because Rodgers isn't going to meet his playing time threshold. Yeah. So I'm interested in even – is a guy like Kirk Cousins on the table? I'm just saying. Right. If you put Kirk Cousins in this Jets offense, there will be turnovers, but there will be plenty of points. Yep. You, listen, you can say what you want about Kirk. Kirk's put up points and yards wherever he's been. Washington, just look at the numbers. The numbers and the points are there. Now, whether or not Kirk can close the deal and not have a turnover late in the big game, the cost in the game, it's TBD. But during the season, Points and yards will be there with Kirk Cousins. I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. All right, so that's uh, that's what I'm, I'm most looking forward to in uh, in week two. We're going to hop back into week one. Um, we talked about our biggest takeaway from week one. What was your most impressive performance from week one? I've got a good one for this one. What was your most impressive performance? Okay, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to pick one offensive guy, one defensive guy. De- sure, defensively, sure. <laughs> de- defensively, 
it's got to be TJ Watt. The guy was relentless against the San Francisco 49ers team that by all accounts is just as good as they were last year, if not better. But Mike got three sacks, five quarterback hits, two forced fumbles in week one. Now he gets to take on a rookie right tackle like we talked about at the top of the show. TJ Watt, it, it, it almost like I'm not a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I really – I'm a Dolphins guy, honestly, at, at this point. I've always been a huge Tom Brady fan, so I've rooted for him wherever he's gone. But now I'm kind yeah. of left aimless without a team. But I'd like make Mike McDaniel, so I think that's my new team. Yeah. So I'm not. I don't have like a dog in the in the fight. But TJ Watt is just so fun to 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 see take the football field every week, and he has such an impact on the game that it's almost sad that he can do what he did on Sunday and his football team lose by three or four touchdowns. So I mean, I'm just I'm I'm rooting for that guy to keep having sustained success. I think he's a a heck of an athlete. And hopefully Pittsburgh can, can do something to, to keep him in the defensive player of the year conversation. Offensively, it does have to be Tua. I mean, Ooh, coming off of a season, like like everybody was like, oh, should he play football again? Should he retire? We're worried about his head. He, he, went, he did some unorthodox training in the offseason with judo, with judo uh, trying to fall better, strengthening his, knuck, his neck muscles, things that are not common practice in the NFL. He comes out. He made all the easy throws that Mike McDaniel schemed open for him, which you have to do. It's an underrated part of being a great quarterback. Right. But some of the throws that he made down the field, he hit Tyreek Hill on a third and 10 down the right sideline. On the run, he stepped up in the pocket, threw off a one leg, just chucked it up there. I mean, he laid it in perfect between two defenders. The yeah. throw he made to Tyreek Hill, the game-winning touchdown, you oh, could yeah. not have thrown a better football. Right, right above the defender, and but he, and, and let me say this too. With that particular play, one of the things that I love because this is how you know great receivers, right? Tyreek didn't give the defender any indication the ball was coming. He literally, li- he barely raised his hands. Like I, I don't think people understand that. Like if he raises his hands, the defender just reaches up and knocks his ball down. Tyreek literally sits there and watches the ball come into the bread basket. And I, I'm saying that to support what you're saying. If the ball is thrown anywhere else, he's got to move his hands against the ball. Tyreek just literally let it come into his body and just yeah. clutched it. Incredible way to close that game out. All right, I'm handing it back to you. I'm with I'm what about you, Chief? I'm with what, what's, you. No, you tell me. What were you most impressed by in week one? So in week one, believe it or not, I was most impressed, wait for it, with the L.A. Rams. I thought, listen, everything coming out of the Rams camp was that this team was dead. Nothing. This team wasn't going to win many football games, and they still may not, right? Uh, uh, watch this. Matthew Stafford can't connect with these young receivers. I don't know what's happened. It was, I mean, it was, if you listen to the media, and this is why I'm trying to convince people on Aaron Rodgers so much when I come on the show, the media will lead you astray all the time. If you listen to the media, the Rams facility was on fire. Everything was burning to the ground. And they come out against Seattle and Geno Smith, who everybody, thought, I thought the, 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 the Seahawks would have run away with this game somehow. And all Matthew Stafford does is take this young, terrible receiving core, right? But, I mean, he's got uh, the, the new guy and, and and Van Jefferson and Tyler Higby and Tutu Atwell. I mean, and they win this football game. Now, they get the 49ers this week, which they'll probably lose. But I think the biggest takeaway is Matthew Stafford got it done when everybody said the facility was on fire, there's, I mean, he's, you've got his wife spilling the beans saying he can't connect. They win the football game and, and they win by a, a pretty wide margin considering this the NFL. Like the NFL to me is a three point football league. It's a field goal at the end of every game. Most of the time. Right. You know, three, yeah, three to was, seven points. Even close. I mean, they, they right. won the second half 23, nothing. That, that's what I'm saying. They didn't, they didn't just win this. They ran away with it. What in the world is going on in Seattle? I, I don't know, but my that's my biggest takeaway. Matthew Stafford and the Rams got it done when all we heard was this team was 
on the way to outer space somewhere. Aaron Donald still looks like Aaron Donald, even with this defense supposed, supposedly being the worst defense they were going to see. Aaron Donald still out there making plays and to close it out. This is the one that everybody's heard. It's been all over the news, social media. Aaron Donald comes around on a stunt or a twist. It might have been a twist. And Geno Smith is saying, oh, my God. I don't know if you've seen that clip. My goodness. Unbelievable performance by the Rams. And I think they're getting overlooked because there were so many other things that happened, like the Cowboys set out of the Giants, which could have also made this list. But I just wanted to shout out the Rams because everybody said this team was done. This, this was supposed to, supposed to be an 0-17 team. And they come yeah. out of the gate and win in convincing fashion. Incredible. So let me ask you, Chief, how much of that win do you think is a reflection of the Rams playing well versus Geno Smith having 112 passing yards, Kenneth Walker being pretty mad? I mean, DK DK Metcalf had 47 receiving yards. No one else on the on the Seahawks had more than 17. I mean, where, where are you at, Tyler Lockett? I know Jackson uh, Smith just got back. But so how much of that is – like the Rams played well, we should be impressed by the Rams. And how much of that is Gino got his bag, and now he's not interested in football anymore. And I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but yeah, yeah. you know what I'm you know what I'm asking? Yeah, it's week one. I don't want to overreact. I still don't think the Rams are great. But what I'm saying is, the Rams, if you listen to everyone, aren't supposed to win any football games, and they come out and beat a team convincingly. Like, this wasn't a, a field goal at the end. This wasn't a Geno throws a pick so that, so they get to kick a field goal. They won 30 to 13. That's not the makings of – if your offense is bad, even against a bad defense, it's hard to score 30 points in the NFL, no, no matter how you slice it. Kyron Williams is out there running all over the place. I know he scored a couple of touchdowns. But my point is to say that this team – was so was written off so bad. Matthew Stafford had 334 yards passing. That to me, that's not the sign of an offense that can't score points. Tutu Atwell had six catches for 119 yards. Geno Smith doesn't play defense. Like you, you know what I'm saying? Like Puka Nakua had 10 catches for 119 yards. But this, this team is supposed to be bad, Nick. Like that—that's everything I heard. Well, that's what I'm asking, right? I mean, that, we're trying to make sense of it. I'm also looking at 40 carries for 92 yards. I mean, that's probably not going to win a lot of football games, right? No, so. no, it's 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 not. But Matt Matthew Stafford, 24 for 38, 334 yards. I just once again, Geno can't play play uh, play defense. If if okay. I, you didn't play a lot of offense you, either on Sunday. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll give you this one. <laughs> if Matthew Stafford has 189 yards passing and they scored 30 points on, like, three defensive scores and, and Matt can't move the ball, okay, like, this wouldn't have made my list. The reason this is making my list, Stafford 334. Now, the run game was awful. Don't get me wrong. 300. 34 yards passing for Matt Stafford this week. No touchdowns, but that's okay. 334. Two receivers over 100. 10 catches for Puka. Six catches for Tutu. Three for Higby. Four for Van Jefferson. One for Bryce Hopkins. I I can't overlook that type of output when this team was supposed to be buried from the start. I, I just... So what this says to me is while they probably won't beat San Francisco, they're going to win a lot more games than we thought. And if, if Seattle, it's week one, I'm still expecting Seattle to be a better team than, than, than the Rams. Don't get me wrong. But in this division, if they win enough games, they may make the playoffs. It's possible. So let me leave you with this, Chief, because this supports what you're saying here. The Rams and the Seahawks both had nine drives on Sunday. The Rams had 426 yards of total offense. The Seahawks had 180. The Rams had time of possession, 39 minutes, compared to the Seahawks, 21 minutes. The Rams ran 78 plays on offense. The Seahawks ran 46. If you can do that, especially against teams that on paper maybe have more talent than you, and I'm talking about teams like 
the 49ers and other teams that were already throwing up there as scheduled losses. If you only let them keep the football for 20 minutes and they run half as many offensive plays as you, you're going to give yourself a chance to win. And people forget, yet yeah, is a lot of that talent gone? Is Cooper Cup on the IR right? Yes. They're, they're missing a lot of pieces. It's not a team that's going to win the Super Bowl like they did a couple of years ago. Von Miller's not there. Jalen Ramsey's not there. Those boys are gone. Sean McVay is still there, who yeah. as recently as last year was widely regarded as one of, if not the best coach in the NFL. And that matters a lot in the NFL. I think even more than a lot of other sports, coaching has a tremendous impact on what teams are able to do week to week. And I'm with you. I I do think like if Matthew Stafford can look like this Matthew Stafford and not the one that we saw last year who was dealing with the elbow injury and obviously wasn't healthy, if Stafford can play close to what he looked like against the Seahawks, that raises this, it raises the floor of this team a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And, And my last thing I'll say about this team, and, and I, I bet nobody probably thought we were talking about the Rams, but I thought it was very important to call out this team because of how we most people had written them off. I saw a quote, uh, Nick, that said this team was going to be so bad. They said, I, I don't even know that I don't even know these players. They said it's Aaron Donald and a bunch of XFL uh <laughs> defenders. I literally saw this quote somewhere on the internet, and they come out and win this game. Kudos to the Rams for, uh, for for just getting it done. Kudos to the Rams. All right, we're moving here. Nick, this is, this is going to be a favorite segment of mine today. Possible big performances for week two. What are some possible big performances? But player, team, combination, could be a player and team. We got plenty of time, my man. So possible big performances week two. I'm taking the Las Vegas Raiders. Stop it. See, see, guys, you don't know me and Nick talk offline. And the, the Raiders were a team I was going to talk about coming up. So go ahead. I, I want to let you have this. One. Go right ahead. So I'm looking at these lines right here. Depends what book you're looking at. You can get the Raiders as much as plus 10 in this football game against the, the Buffalo Bills. The Raiders on paper, they don't look like they got a lot of talent. But people forget that this was a team that a lot of people had a lot of good things to say about last offseason. And it's not a totally different football team. And I think, if anything, you've upgraded at quarterback. You still have some pieces defensively. I still think Josh McDaniels is a pretty good coach. Like I, I think now he's got some some weapons offensively. you got Devontae Adams back, obviously, Jacoby Myers. Like there's, there's things, and I know Jacoby Myers got hurt, but you know, assuming he's able to play, but – They have some nice pieces in Las Vegas. And you talked about Josh Allen, or you teased him a little bit early, earlier in the show. I've never been a huge Josh Allen fan. Obviously, he's got all the tools. He's got the big arm. He can make plays with his legs, which gives you a high floor week to week. And that's what I think more than anything, if you're assembling a team in the NFL, you're looking to put together a team that has a high floor with a high ceiling. The problem in my mind with Josh Allen is he so rarely gets to that high ceiling because last night, if you're the the Buffalo Bills, Aaron Rodgers is gone in the first quarter. Josh Allen, you you turn into a quarterback at that point where it's like you don't turn the ball over four times, and this game's not even a sweat. Even if we have to keep going down and kicking field goal, field goal, field goal, it's not the sexiest way to win a football game. But the the field conditions weren't great after the storms that rolled yeah, through. It was not. It just feels like I mean there was a couple of shots downfield. Josh Allen threw two interceptions on balls where he had guys wide open underneath for first downs. And if you go back and watch the film, it's like you don't need to hit the home run all the time, and especially in the context of that game script where you're going against Zach Wilson, a young quarterback who thought he was going to be able to sit back and just chill on Monday Night Football, watch Aaron Rodgers you know, play his first game with the New York Jets. And Josh Allen just doesn't have the awareness that I think a lot of people would like for him to have. Now the Raiders, I think their linebacker core is, is pretty weak, so maybe Josh Allen is able to make a few more plays with his legs. Maybe Buffalo comes out of there with a win this week. But every week I do an article for RG and for the Survivor Leagues, and I pick one team that I think is by far the most trustworthy that you should lock in for Survivor if you have them left. And then there's one team that I put on upset alert. Last week I had the Kansas City Chiefs. They opened as six-and-a-half-point favorites. They were my team that was on upset alert. Of course, they lost to the Detroit Lions. This week 
I haven't done the article yet, but I'm leaning towards the Buffalo Bills on a short week against a Las Vegas team that has a quarterback that's better than people think, that's better coached than people think, yeah. and that has a few players on the defensive side of the ball going against a Buffalo team that, by the way, their secondary is not that good. You got and now you got a head coach who's also the defensive coordinator, and people don't re- like it's the small stuff. Last night, not taking those, it, it ended up not biting them because they uh, doinked in the field goal to force overtime. But not taking timeouts on the flip side of the two minute warning, they they yeah. cost themselves a fair amount of time. Instead of kicking a fifty yard field goal, maybe you got a shot at the end zone or a couple of shots at the end zone on that final drive. You don't even have to go to overtime. So all of this is what my point is. That the Buffalo Bills, I do not think, are anywhere as good as people think. I think they have a lot more flaws defensively, especially with Von Miller not playing to start the season. And the Raiders sort of, I mean, it was a 425 time slot, two two teams that people aren't super interested in. 10-point underdogs in this matchup just seems like a lot to me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you 100%. Um, I like that call. The reason I was going to talk about the Raiders is, um, I think Jimmy G just continues to be underrated. I think, you know, when they sit on the San Francisco, everybody everybody feels like you can just take any quarterback and plug them in the Kyle Shanahan system and it's going to work. So Jimmy loses – he kind of loses respect, right? Because it's like, oh, well, I mean, they don't need Jimmy. Like, you know, they got Brock Purdy. Well, Trey Lance didn't work out either. Um, you know, so, like – Jimmy's been successful whenever he's been at offense and his first game with the Raiders game was close. Don't get me wrong. Like he had to close the game out with the eight yard rush for, for Denver to not get the ball back, but he did what he had to do to win the game. When, when the throws had to be made, the throws were there, right? Like that last, the drive before the game clinching one, the throw to Jacoby Myers, the throw, the throw to, Devontae on a cross or coming across the like th- these are all professional throws that you have to make when you want to close football games. Like right? you have to make them. And if you can't, that's the difference between a win and a loss. And so Jimmy made the throws that he had to make when he had to make them. And not only that, game on the line, Jimmy gets the eight-yard rush. That those are professional quarterback plays. That that that's the reason they won this game. Jimmy doesn't Jimmy doesn't try to force some throw. He t- t- takes what the defense gives him and says, hey, I'll just go get it with my legs, and we close this thing out and we go home with the W. That's professional quarterback play. Good call for sure with the Raiders. Uh, here's something I'm, I'm most uh, looking forward to. This is the team I'm most looking forward to this week. Um, maybe it's a surprise. Maybe it's not a surprise. I'm most looking forward to the Detroit Lions, and here's why. You can't come off of a big win against Kansas City and then let the Seahawks come in and win this game. If they lose to the Seahawks this week, this is going to make national media news because right now I'm looking at Detroit's minus five and a half, right, and they're at home where Jared Goff typically plays much better. And we just saw the Seahawks get throttled by the Rams. This team has a lot more talent and name value than Los Angeles Rams, Nick. They better win this game. And it need, in my opinion, it needs to be somewhat convincing. What I'm saying is I don't think Jared Goff has to throw for 300 yards, but they need to have successful drives consecutively. Like we don't need to see them struggle and it's, Three to three at the end at the end of the first half. That's going to give us pause for concern. I think we need to see something something in the first seventeen to seven in the first half. I think is fine, right? Because you know, once again, it's all in. This is these are all NFL teams. I don't expect any game to be blowouts, but I think seventeen to seven, seventeen to ten. I think that's respectable, and I think by the end of this game, we need to see something around 24, 10, 24, you know, fourteen. It needs to be somewhat convincing. So we can keep saying, okay, this team is coming, they're arriving, because if they struggle with the Seahawks this week at home, I think I think that's going to give us some pause for concern with a team that we're expecting to continue to extend and be great now. So let me ask you, I know you're telling me we need to see that. Do you think it's going to happen? 
Based I off do. what you saw in week one. So facts only. They yeah. they won the football game 21-20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jared Goff took care of the football when he took to, when he needed Absolutely. to. Absolutely. He yeah. made a couple of throws when he needed yep. to get first downs. So fa- that was facts only. But now what what do you expect? Like I know what you said you needed to see, mm-hmm. but what do you expect in that football game against the Seahawks? So I, I think this is a possible big performance spot. That's where I was headed. I think this is a possible big performance spot for the Detroit Lions offense as a whole. Let, let me tell you why. I think picking up David Montgomery was a very underrated pickup for them because so, – so here's what Jamal Williams was last year. He was a touchdown monster, but more, more importantly, he was a veteran presence – in a young running back room, in my opinion, right? A guy you could depend on, a guy that could, he was going to be a professional. Well, they were losing that, and they also lost DeAndre Swift, who had a lot of injury problems. So what did they do? They, they couldn't wait on Jamal. They, they, they were drafting Jameer Gibbs, drafting him early, but they bring in David Montgomery, a guy that's been in the league a little while, right? A guy that, as long as he's healthy, he's going to be a solid running back. He's going to be a, a professional running back in the league. Why, why am I why am I why am I why am I bringing this up? For all of the young talent that they have on this team, you can't win with just the young guys, right? You got to have some veterans to keep the ship moving forward and help keep things in perspective. I think they've got the perfect mix of veterans and young guys on this team now. Sam Laporte is a young tight end. But to bring in a guy, bring a guy back like Marvin Jones, who's been with the organization, been in the league, right? Can help keep keep pushing a modern Ross St. Brown forward. Hopefully, can help keep Jamison Williams out of trouble, right? David Montgomery helps 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 Jameer Gibbs keep pushing forward, and you got Jared Goff, who's like kind of in the middle of his career now, possibly his prime. And they've got one of the best play action games in football. Cause that, that's where Jared Goff excels, right? It's not just him dropping back, throwing for 50 million passes. It's they get going in this running game. And all of a sudden Jared Goff is teasing him with the eye candy. He pulls it back and we've got a guy running down the middle. And all he has to do is make the throws. He's going to make the throws this week. I think they're going to win this game convincingly because of the complimentary football that they're going to play. I think picking up C.J. Gardner-Johnson gives this defense an edge, right? Yeah, he's chirpy and he's chattery, but he's going to back it up. He's going to make sure this defense has an elevated level of play. Have you seen teams when the defense is on the field making plays, the offense comes out juvenated? Hey, guys, we just got to go score points now. We don't, have, we don't have to do – we don't have to be – we don't have to take too many chances. Stick to our game plan. And then not only that, not only that, Dan Campbell, here's what I'll say about Dan Campbell. He's going to trust his team to win football games. All right, all right. Hear what I'm saying here. And I'll parlay that into something we saw in the Thursday night game. They come out, Dan Campbell doesn't want a stale drive early, right? It's the psychological factor of his team. He, doesn't, he says, no, 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 no. We're not going to have a stale drive early. So what does he do? Fake punt on fourth and one, fourth and two, Right? He plays aggressive, right? He plays aggressive. That's psychological. Like, I know we don't think about that in football, but that, that's a psychological boost for your team. Thanks, Coach. You believe in us. Now we're going to go out and, and get this thing going. So that doesn't mean he's going to be going for fake punts every week. What it does mean is this: he has faith in his team to get the job done, and he's going to ensure that they stay aggressive. From what I've seen, if you stay aggressive with the Seattle team, and that's not just – this year, that was last year too. If you stay aggressive, does Seattle have the horses, right, to not make those mental mistakes on offense and keep up? We've seen, and it's not just Geno Smith. We've seen DK Metcalf drop big passes late in games, right? Little things like that. I think they're going to keep the pressure on, and that's how they're going to win this game. I think it's going to be methodical. I don't think it's going to be big splash plays. I think it's going to be, it's like, once again, consecutive drives with points, whether it's seven or three. They're going to continuously score points and slowly run up the scoreboard on Seattle. And by the by the time they get to the end of this game, it could be real ugly. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch, man. I'm excited to see DK Metcalf in man coverage again. Last year had seven catches for 149 yards against the Lions. So coming off of a down week, it'd be interesting to see that. 
but I'm with you. I think Dan Campbell, he's turned into somewhat of a caricature because of the hard knock stuff and just everything associated with the Lions going from poverty to perceived riches going into 2023. But there's something to be said about a coach who's willing to call. A, I was thinking the same thing before you said it to go for it on fourth and short in your own territory or that early in the game. It, it establishes a certain level of trust with your players too, yes. where then the players are like, like, cause you're, I'm with you. Like you don't want to steal drive, but then the players are like, Hey man, like he trusts us to get this done. It's a yard. Even though we're in our own territory, like he, he knows we're going to convert, keep this alive, try to go put up some points. We saw it last year. He was the sixth most aggressive coach on fourth down. They play at a high pace. They they get in a healthy mix of play action. Jameer Gibbs, by the way, oh, my God. I, I know he wasn't on the field a whole a whole lot, but he looked like he's a Ferrari. Yeah. I, he's he looked like a Ferrari in college. But it's a whole different level of skill when you get to the yeah. NFL. And he still looked like a different cat when he was out there. And like you said, you got David Montgomery handling a lot of the stuff between the tackles. If you can creatively find ways to get Jameer Gibbs the ball in space, it felt like every time he touched the ball, he was 10 yards down the field against oh, yeah. the team. Seriously, seriously. And I, I think we'll see some of that this week. And I'm with you on Gibbs, right? Like, for, for as much as we love Tyreek Hill, Tyreek Hill has, like, raw speed. Yep. Jameer Gibbs is, like, shooting out of a cannon. Like, yep. did you see that one? Uh, I can't remember if it was a catch or a run. He's coming down the sideline, freezes, spins with, and it's like, my gosh! Like just out of nowhere. I, I'm, yep. I'm with you on Gibbs. Uh, I think he's he's big time. Here's my big. So that's my big team of the week, Detroit Lions. Right. Here's my big performance in terms of a player uh, this week. Uh, I'm going with. It's. Let's call it somewhat uh, of a bounce back spot. Somewhat of a bounce back spot. Um, The one, the only, Daniel Jones. Hear me me out here. Hear, Hear me out here. Here's why I'm going with Daniel Jones this week. I think it's only up from here after that throttling he took last week Danny isn't going to throw for like 300 yards but I think plus 200 um, I think he'll have 50 yards rushing in this game like they can't hear what I'm saying it's kind of like the reverse effect of um, the, the Lions where the Lions can't come out and like win this game by three points, the Giants can't lose it. Can't have another blowout like the, like we saw Monday night. And a lot of things went against them. Like the Cowboys' defense is supposed to be good. Don't get me wrong, but I think Daniel Jones, if he's going to have a big performance, it's got to be this week against Arizona. And I'm not a Daniel Jones fan. Don't get me wrong, but for me, I'm always in look ahead mode in the NFL because I, I think the look ahead in the NFL is probably more important than any other sport because of the lack of games. But two games back, you lose two games, and that, that could just really set your season back. So I'm always in look ahead mode. Here's why I think it's important. So if they get they get the Cardinals this week, the next week they get the 49ers. They better win this game because they're not winning next week. This team isn't going to beat the 49ers. I can tell you that right now. They're not beating the 49ers. So they have to get this game to stay alive because if they do and the Seahawks end up being bad, they get the Seahawks the next week, right? And then the week after that, they get the Dolphins, which they probably will lose, but they should be able to score points. My my point my point is Daniel Jones is going to have to psychologically get ready to play well this week. And I'm, I'm expecting to have a big performance against Arizona uh via via the combo stats rushing and passing that's what i'm expecting from daniel jones this week if we don't get it this week brian dable is officially out of new york uh chief i i don't know if we disagree or not on this because you didn't like you didn't because it's daniel jones i know you didn't exactly full send uh, your vote of confidence in daniel jones but I am short-selling Daniel Jones as much as human 
humanly possible. Last season, he threw for 15 touchdowns, had only five interceptions. I mean, he cut his his interception rate in half compared to what he did early in his career. 2019, played 13 games, 12 interceptions. 2020, 10 picks in 14 games. 2021, seven picks in 11 games. And then last year, all of a sudden, only five interceptions in 16 games. A lot of people, I think, were really eager to say, well, that's the Brian Dabble effect. You know, he didn't force him to throw deep. He didn't force him to do things that he was uncomfortable doing. So Daniel Jones took that next step. So it made sense to re-sign him. I think signing Daniel Jones to an extension, and I know it wasn't the richest contract in NFL history, but I think even giving him the money that they did, I think it was like $150 million, set this franchise back a decade. And the reason I will say that, whenever you see a quarterback cut his interception rate in half, or going the other way, if like if a guy like Aaron Rodgers we talked about never throws interceptions, and then he has one year where he doubles his interception rate, almost always you're going to see that number come back to reality the following season, for better or for worse. Daniel Jones last year had five interceptions. He still had 17 interception-worthy throws, despite the fact that Dabal never let him throw the ball down the field. So we still, yes, the Cowboys defense is great. The Cowboys defense, no defense in NFL history should be 40 nothing great against a division rival on opening night where you have all the time in the world to prepare for each other. That was embarrassing. Oh, no, absolutely. Embarrassing. Absolutely. And now you're going to play a Cardinals team that they are completely devoid of talent. I mean, they have no talent on that football team, but they play hard. I noticed that in the preseason, and then I know a lot of people probably didn't have their NFL ticket set to the Commanders and the Cardinals week one. But the Cardinals played tough, man. They're like they're going to play with a lot of energy. And I'll tell you what, talent is going to win football games a lot in the NFL. It's going to win football games a lot more than effort will. But effort is going to force teams into costly miscues. They had a strip sack that they ran in for a touchdown that made that game a lot closer than the talent would have suggested. Yeah, I think we see it again. The Giants have children at cornerback. <laughs> I mean, the secondary is so young. They're so inexperienced. And then you look at the offense and it's like, what's to like here? You got Jalen Hyatt pretending to be Od- Odell Beckham reincarnate, dropping passes, running poor routes. Like, I just don't think there's anything to like about the Giants. And I know you mentioned you like to look ahead at the schedule. Let's just humor me for a sec. Let's say somehow Arizona wins this game at home. San Francisco, that's a loss. 0-3. They get to host the Seahawks. Maybe they get a win there. We'll call it 1-3. But then they get Miami, Buffalo. They could be one and five going into Washington. Then they get New York, the Raiders, the Cowboys again. They don't oh, have yeah. a bye week till week 13. And they really don't have any scheduled wins in 2023. Like this team could be looking at potentially a top five pick. They, they probably will. They probably will. What, once again, the reason I'm giving Daniel Jones this game is for a lot of the reasons you said. Arizona doesn't have talent. And and Daniel Jones played about the worst game of football he could have played uh, Monday night. Dak Prescott didn't play well either, but they won the game, right? And and that's, that, 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 so that's really what that's really what I'm looking at here in this situation. Like when I look at Dak, Dak missed a lot of throws in that game. Like, yeah, you know, C.D. Lamb, he's throw, he had C.D. for a touchdown, threw it a little bit too high. Like, just just missing throw, threw, throwing Brandon Cooks on out routes, throwing it too high. Like, I don't I don't know, you know, what that was about. And I know they had the weather there too, right? Like, they had pouring down rain. So, I, I'm, giving, I'm giving him a pass because the defense created a lot of the momentum in that game for the Dallas Cowboys, which is going to lead me to my, my last one. This week, Dak's in trouble. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Match up with the Jets. The, the, that's in trouble this week. I'll close the show with that. Nick, do you have anything else you want to add? I know this was a slightly different feel for this particular show, but we want to give those segments and Luch will be back this week. Anything else you want to say before we close this thing out? I think my final thing that I would advise people to look at this week is I would take a strong, hard look at Justin Jefferson unders this week. I know everybody loves Jetta. I know, I know Jetta looked real, real nice in the first half against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, it's going to be a different level for him against the Philadelphia Eagles on Thursday yeah. Night Football. And I will say, as much as people like Justin Jefferson and as athletic as he is and as good, uh, as strong of hands as he has, he does not like 
to get down and, and dirty against these cornerbacks. He likes his free releases. He likes being schemed open, and he does a lot of damage after the catch, which is a valuable skill. Yeah, But it's different going against guys like Darius Slay. It's different going against the defending NFC champions. I think he could be in prison. I think he could be bullied a lot on Thursday night. I, I think I saw his opening line at like 96, 97 and a half receiving yards. As soon as we get off this show, I'm going to take a, a long, hard look at that, and I would recommend other people do the same. All right, folks, you heard it from the commish, the man, the myth, the legend himself, closing this thing out with fire, telling us all, take a long, hard look. Wait, wait, that means you need to get in on it now at Justin Jefferson Unders. I'm Chief. That's the commish. This has been Food for Thought Week 2. See you next week, everybody.